Let's uh, go ahead and get started. We are in Acts chapter 13 this morning. And uh, this morning in chapter 13, as you know, if you've been in the class, we are at a bit of a juncture. Uh, We are shifting from uh, the preliminaries, in some ways, of Acts to this great moment when now we have Paul actually beginning his first missionary excursion. Uh, And I've indicated to you, if you've been following along here, that this introduces then the third major section of the book of Acts, which is organized around three journeys. We've had three sermons, the first part of Acts, followed by uh, three conversions, the second part of Acts, and now three journeys, in which Paul is transporting the gospel, uh, you know, technically from Jerusalem, really from Antioch, but uh, we would say from Jerusalem, its base, to the world. And it's a fascinating adventure, uh, the first real detail of Christian missionary enterprise that we have in the history of the church, but manifestly not the last. And Paul becomes the great paradigm of a great missionary scholar who goes out and courageously carries the gospel around the ancient world. So we're right at the beginning, the threshold of that conversation, and that, of course, is uh, chapter 13. Chapter 13 actually gives us two of the stops that Paul makes, the first of them in the uh, island of Cyprus, and then he goes north from Cyprus up into what's southern Turkey uh, to a town called Antioch of Pisidia, not to be confused with Antioch of Cilicia, which is where he's uh, taken his home base to start this venture. Uh, We won't look at the second of those visits this morning, but only the first of them. So we have a a rather shorter text. It's actually verses 1 through 12 of Acts chapter 13. Then next week we have a huge bite because I'd like to take the rest of it uh, and get that all behind us next week. So that'll be, uh, as you can tell if you're looking at it, uh, quite a bit of material to cover, but I think we can do it. We'll just have to uh, move rather rapidly. So this morning we can be somewhat more leisurely, only 12 verses. Uh, We should be able to cover that. Let's uh, let's take a look at it then. We're at chapter 13, verse 1. This is page 131, if you're using the Pew Bible. And I don't know what page it is if you're using your own, but you'll find your way there. And let's uh, read this text then. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had also John assisting them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bargesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But the magician, Elymas, for that is the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked? the straight paths of the Lord. And now listen, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. So that's our text of the morning. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on our consideration of it. Father, we are grateful that you give us now in the pages of this text, this first introduction to the gospel going to the world, 
through your great emissary, the Apostle Paul. And we pray that we might live this story with him, that we would learn those things that would make us your missionaries as well, who sense your presence and confidence by virtue of your spirit, would in a like way carry the gospel to those with whom you bring us in contact. We give you thanks for it. We ask your blessing on our reflection on this text now in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, uh, back at chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Uh, This is really the third reference we've had to the city of Antioch. You may recall back in chapter 11, we heard that after the persecution that followed the stoning of Stephen, Christian people went out here and there around the world, some of whom went to Antioch. And it was in Antioch, we understand, that they began to preach the gospel, not restricting the scope of their audience simply to Jewish people, but apparently, again, preaching across the Great Divide uh, to people who were Gentile. And that, again, seems to have provoked a bit of a stir back in Jerusalem. We've seen this, of course, several times before. And so, in light of that, they sent the trusted uh, uh, leader, Barnabas, to go to Antioch and to see what's up. And so as he arrived there, he saw the great evidence of God's grace working in the Antiochian church, and he was so impressed with it that he thought, this is just where we need to find Saul. He goes to Tarsus some miles away, brings Saul back to Antioch, and of course we saw the entire story that plays out there. They stayed there for about a year, and it was in that connection, you may recall, that a figure by the name of Agabus, a prophet, had by God's uh, illumination, been, been able to see that there was going to be a famine that was coming. We're told at the end of chapter 11 that that famine actually occurred under the reign of the Caesar Claudius. And that occurred, uh, we understand from external sources, beginning about the year 44. So that helps us date uh, some of these events that took place. Because they saw this difficult time coming, Paul and Barnabas themselves set about the task of collecting some funds to help out the, uh, what would be destitute saints, Christian people in Jerusalem. And that became the underpinnings of what was called the famine visit that took place somewhat later. Then Antioch plays again in the story uh, toward the end of chapter 12. If you want to glance at that, verse 24 of chapter 12, after Herod Agrippa I has died, you'll remember that last time we were together, the word of the Lord, however, continued to advance and gain adherence. Then after completing their mission, that is a mission of collecting these funds, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, bringing with them John Mark, or John whose other name was Mark. So Paul and Barnabas now come to Jerusalem. This seems to be still the year 44, probably shortly after Herod has died. This is called the famine visit. It's presumably the visit that Paul refers to in the book of Galatians, uh, which I'm assuming some of you have looked at, and, and it kind of parallels the text here. Now chapter 13, the shift is back to Antioch. So we have Paul and Barnabas have discharged their duties in Jerusalem. They've traveled back to Antioch. That's where we find them. And there in this church, we hear that there are prophets and teachers, um, probably referring to the same people. Some have thought these were two different groups of people, but it at least appears that Luke has in mind the very people that he names here. Prophets, presumably in the narrow sense, that is not simply preachers, but people who at this time in history were supernaturally uh, anointed to have insight that they would not ordinarily have. That is supernatural insight, particularly about the future. And so that seems to be the sense of the word prophet here. Uh, We've discussed whether that continues to be an abiding office in the church. I won't uh, deal with that again. But they are not only called prophets, but also teachers. Teachers understood as those who are somewhat more methodical and conventional. They kind of go through the outline, lay it out step by step, and so we have these two different kinds of ministries, but both of them being carried on, apparently, by these five people. Uh, The five are mentioned, first of all, Barnabas. We've seen him before. He's, of course, going to become a prominent player and already has been. Then we have a reference to Simeon, who was called Niger. Uh, The word Niger simply means black. There's been uh, some uh, speculation, I think with good reason, that Simeon himself may have been a black man. 
We have no, uh, certainly no intimation in the scriptures that there was any concern whatsoever within the New Testament church with respect to a person's skin color. That was a non-issue. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, was presumably a black man. Uh, the only hint of any kind of racism that we find in the New Testament is, as you're well aware, as between Jews and non-Jews. And that was not, properly speaking, racism. It was kind of a religious racism because the Jewish world was perfectly happy to receive Gentiles as proselytes. And they would become Jews in good standing regardless of their you know, racial uh, uh, configuration. Otherwise, it was not an issue as long as they went through all of the gauntlet you know, of becoming a Jew in good standing. That was part of the whole deal with the New Testament message. Can people simply come into the church without going through the regimen of conversion to Judaism in the first place? Uh, apparently so. That's certainly the message of the book of Acts. There's no concern about skin color, uh, ethnic origins, all of those kinds of things. It's, uh, it's really not even a, an issue. And I, I mention that because you may be aware that there have always been through history, and we've seen it in recent history, those who have attempted to construct a kind of racism out of the Bible, and particularly, I think you're familiar with those who've tried to argue that there's some sort of superiority to the white race, and they'll base it on certain obtuse views of certain texts in the Old Testament. Without going any, you know, any deeper into that, it is hogwash, it's ridiculous. You can't even begin to make such an argument. And if anything, the New Testament knocks itself out to prevent us from you know, cons constructing such a bizarre thing. So uh, just for whatever it's worth, let's get that on the record. And, uh, and Simeon, in any event, uh, may have been a black man. Whether he was or not, certainly there was no concern about skin color in the New Testament church. The next one that's mentioned here is Lucius of Cyrene. Uh, correct pronunciation, Cyrene. Uh, Lynn Otto, my good friend who spent many years over there professionally, came up to me very kindly, modestly, corrected me the other day because I've been saying Cyrene. And so I want to, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Lynn's correction there. It is Cyrene, and that's exactly the way it's shown in the pronunciation of the text, so you know, I should have seen that. Anyway, Lucius of Cyrene, which is down in Africa. Manian, a member of the court of Herod the ruler. Uh, so Manian is a member of the uh, political uh, authority here in some sense. He's with Herod. The Herods in the New Testament are somewhat confusing, uh, and we've mentioned these before. There's actually seven of them all together. There was Herod the Great, four sons. You can remember them because three started with A, Aristobulus, Antipas, Archelaus, and Philip. Isn't that easy? Philip is the fourth one, not an A. Aristobulus had a son who was Agrippa I. Agrippa I is the guy that died, you know, two weeks ago. Aristobulus was killed by Herod the Great. Uh, the other Agrippa we run into is the one that Paul will stand before uh, in his trial later in the book of Acts. The Herod that is being referred to here is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the ruler of the region of Cilicia to the north, which is where Antioch is located. And so Manian here, who's referred to, was some kind of official in Herod's court. What this tells us is that the Christian faith draws from all of the social spectrum. Uh, this is one of the most remarkable things about the Christian faith through history, is that it is an equal opportunity religion. You see, we don't focus on the bright or the not-so-bright, the rich or the not-so-rich, the sophisticated or the not-so-sophisticated. As Paul says, I'm a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarian. Uh, you know, all across the way, uh, there's no restriction, no kind of selective, uh, you know, process of sifting through those who are proper targets for a presentation of the gospel. None of that in the New Testament. And it's interesting that as you survey history, you'll find that, uh, that, that people come from every conceivable area of life. The, some of the brightest and most uh, you know, brilliant geniuses of history have been devoted to the Christian faith, while other geniuses have been hostile to it. And at the other end of the intellectual spectrum, or the socioeconomic spectrum, or the political spectrum, or whatever spectrum you want to talk about, you'll find the same thing, that people from all all across these various spectra uh, will come to the faith. 
Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a, a bit of an argument for a Calvinistic approach. The reason people come is not because they were so intelligent, or because they were so well-educated, or because they were so this, or because they were so that, but because God called them. That's why. And if God calls you, you will come. And it doesn't matter. You see how rich you are, or poor you are, or smart you are, or dumb you are. If God calls you, you will come. And Mannion presumably had been called, notwithstanding his status in Herod's court, he was called. And he came, and he's one of these who's a prophet and a teacher here in the church in Antioch. And then finally, we have, of course, a reference to Saul himself, who will become prominent in our uh, conversation that ensues. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The people of God here in Antioch are fasting and praying. There is within the life of the Christian a proper place for religious discipline. In the Old Testament, the discipline was more or less imposed. It was, you know, sort of set up in advance. There were fast days uh, and so on, that kind of thing. In the New Testament, vastly more flexibility is allowed. We don't have fast days as such within the New Testament religious calendar. We don't even have a religious calendar to speak of as such. It was really left more or less to the uh, thought of the church itself to begin to construct in a much more fluid kind of way those observances that we would incorporate. Certainly, personally, the same thing is true. But it is it is presupposed and assumed that Christian people will have a religious discipline, a time of prayer, you see, a time of celebration, a time of, uh, as it were, bereaving the soul, a time of fasting, a time of feasting, that all of these things are part of the proper uh, sort of rhythm of the life of you know, Christian devotion. I have to say to you, I'm not much of a faster, really. You know, I'm not very good at it. The times that I have fasted, I find that I spend most of my time thinking about hamburgers. I don't know. So I'm not going to hold myself up here as any kind of example of this, except that we should all have some kind of discipline in our lives that we incorporate as part of that rhythm that leads us in a way to come back to the things that are most important and think about them. And it is in the context of those religious disciplines that God will sometimes infuse moments of surprising insight or inspiration. Uh, we see something of that here. These people in Antioch are fasting, they're praying, and then God brings to them this possibly unexpected message, but it breaks in the context of their disciplines. Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. And so something new now is brewing, and it uh, comes to the surface in that connection. Uh, verse 3, after fasting some more and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They laid their hands on them and sent them off. So we have here a paradigm which of course we see repeatedly in the New Testament and the church has repeated throughout her history of commissioning people, laying hands on them, praying, I appreciate it even this morning, Woody having a prayer with an individual who's going to be going away from us, you see. We send people down to Tijuana to build houses. We commission them. We pray. We lay on hands. We do things that are sort of deutero-sacramental, I would say, in the, in the life of the church. They're not sacraments as such, but they have that sort of sacramental feel to them, laying on hands, praying, sending them off, and that's what the church does with these two now, Paul and Barnabas as they'll go off. Uh, the word send here, by the way, clearly conveys within it and implies within it material provision. The sending was not the kind that James makes fun of in the book of James. You know, okay guys, be warmed and filled. And, you know, there they go with no means of support. Uh, the sense of sending here certainly had within it the idea of material financial provision for the needs that they would have. They were not being sent off without the wherewithal, materially, to do the project that they had been called to do. Uh, that's part of what it is to be a Christian person in the kingdom. Some people send, some people are sent. We all have the role to play, and the sending has at least in part that material uh, aspect to it. I feel fairly comfortable talking about that because, you see, I'm a lay person. I'm just one of you, you know. 
Uh, you know, if you're ordained, I have to say, I think there's a little bit of shyness about that because everybody knows that this is how the ordained people get their living, is by offerings and stuff. And so it makes it a little bit, it's, it feels a little bit uh, um, uncomfortable then to start talking too much about money because the cynic in the group can say, well, he's just wanting to you know, raise his salary. We say, that's not, that's not my concern here. So I can say, folks, we need to give. You know, we need to give offerings generously. Now, I'm happy to report we do that. We are a you know, generous church, and we do lots of wonderful things. So at this point, I'm not really beating up on any of us, but saying, let's keep doing it. Let's keep sending out the Pauls and the Barnabai among us, and let's send them around the world with ample material support to do the things that we know God has called us all to do. Uh, there is a proper place for those who put the money in the box to get the job done, just as there's a proper place for the folks who go and use that material resource to do whatever God has called them to. So Paul and Barnabas have the benefit of this church supporting them, and off they go. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they, they uh, sailed to Cyprus. If you have a Bible that you, you know, spent a fair amount of money for. You've got some nice color maps that you might want to find. And I'm sure you'll have one that'll show the missionary journeys of Paul. And it might, you might just want to take a glance at it. Uh, the rest of us, I'll be, I'm happy to report to you that even if you're using the Pew Bible, there's a kind of low-tech map uh, that's back on page 117. So if you've got it, it's just this little half-page deal there. And you might want to glance back at that. So keep your finger at chapter 13, but just uh, flip back to page 117, and you'll notice this little map, and we'll be referring to it from time, and, uh, time to time as we go along. If you look over at the right-hand edge, you'll see there's the city of Antioch. This is Antioch of Cilicia, which is a Roman province. It's right on the Bay of Isis. That's the Mediterranean, that little bay that sticks up there, and Antioch is just to the south and east then of the Mediterranean. Uh, Tarsus is not shown, but it's just around the other side of the bay. Uh, the trip that Paul made was down what's called the Orontes River, which is about 15 miles from Antioch to Seleucia, which is right on the coast. That's a navigable river, and so Paul and Barnabas probably just got on a boat, you see, and they rode down the length of that river right to the, uh, right to the port at Seleucia. Seleucia was named for Seleucus, Seleucus was one of the four generals under Alexander the Great. And so Seleucus on the north in Syria and Asia, Ptolemy on the south took Egypt. Those names show up repeatedly as locations and places. Also, Antiochus was of the Seleucid dynasty, and so the, the, the name Antioch, Antioch is actually from the name Antiochus. So both Seleucia and Antioch come from that uh, uh, history of uh, generals under Alexander the Great. Uh, so anyway, Paul goes down to Seleucia, seaport town, catches a boat, he and Barnabas, uh, from there to Cyprus. If you look at the map, Cyprus, of course, is kind of southwest, uh, going down the, uh, in the Mediterranean to that uh, island there uh, off the coast, probably about, what, 80 miles or so, I think something like that. So they, they reach uh, Cyprus and uh, are going to traverse the length of it. Uh, the first uh, 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 location that they come to is called Salamis. It's on the eastern border there. And what we hear is that they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. It was Paul's custom, as you know, to always go first of all to the Jewish community. He said repeatedly in his ministry that the gospel was first for the Jews. He would always prefer that. He would always go first to the Jewish community. He was a Jew, of course. And so this should be coming to people with whom he was most familiar and with whom he would have the easiest uh, time communicating. But much more deep than that, Paul was going to the Jewish people because they were God's ready-made missionaries. They had been steeped in the expectancy that Messiah would come. Their entire tradition and history had prepared them to have the least learning curve when Messiah did come. And so Paul's hope was that he could go first of all to them, 
and that they would readily recognize that Jesus was the Messiah and that now this cataclysmic event had occurred and that now was the time, you see, for them to set about the task of taking this gospel to the world. And Paul knew that he'd have a much easier time sort of with these people getting it than he would with Gentiles. And so he went first of all to them, hoping, of course, to rally among them others who would, as he was, take the gospel uh, beyond them to the rest of the world. As it turned out, many Jewish people were converted. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the, the initial uh, population of the church was largely Jewish. Uh, so this was a successful strategy on Paul's part. Nevertheless, much to his disappointment, the vast majority of Jewish people did not believe. Uh, it was a remnant, as Paul calls it, a tiny minority that actually would embrace this message, but most of them were hostile to it. And when Paul met with that intractable hostility, he would then eventually finally say, I've had it with you, I'm turning to the Gentiles. He makes that kind of statement several times in the book of Acts. The book of Acts virtually ends with that statement. Uh, you know, I'm turning to the Gentiles. But he'd always go first to the Jews, and so this is a, a, a standard strategy that we see him pursuing at this point. So he goes to the Jewish people, uh, he goes and preaches the gospel to them, and uh, we don't know what the reception was at that point. Luke doesn't tell us. Uh, he does tell us that he had John, that they had John with them, John Mark, probably carrying the baggage. He's a young man. He's assisting them. He's not included as sort of a peer to Barnabas and Paul, but rather, rather seems to be in a secondary role. Uh, and Luke notes that he's coming along with them. That, of course, is interesting because we know that uh, John, Mark, uh, abandons them uh, shortly after this incident. In fact, we'll see that next week. I don't know if he got homesick. I don't know, but he leaves. He goes home. He's at it. Uh, and uh, they hadn't even seen a lot of hard times yet. And uh, Mark uh, goes home. Now, Paul was not pleased with that. Paul's opinion of Mark was for a while that he was a flake, that, uh, you know, the, he leaves us halfway through. I mean, what kind of commitment is that? And so on the second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas wants to bring Mark along with them. It's his nephew, after all. Paul says, no way. I'm going to take this guy. And Paul and Barnabas have such a sharp dispute over it that they part company at that point. Isn't that great? I mean, the New Testament gives us the church warts and all. That should give us a great deal of, you know, Paul, Luke could have sugar-coated that whole deal. And led by the Spirit, Barnabas took Mark, and they went this way, and Paul blessed them and went, no, it says they had a big fight, you know, and they didn't see eye to eye, and they couldn't get on the same page, and that's where they left it. And boy, that's, that's real human beings, you see, and, and that's what God has been using through history. And that's why he can keep using folks just like us, as imperfect as we are. So anyway, John Mark is with them at this point, but not for much longer. All right, so we have in verse 6, uh, then they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, which is, by the way, on the other side of the island. So you can see on your map, they traverse the length of the island, kind of going southwest to the other end, down to what is probably the political center or capital uh, and there they meet a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Uh, he is a, a Jew. Uh, he's said to be a magician, a sorcerer of some kind. Uh, he's said to be a false prophet. The Old Testament, of course, is replete with false prophets. Uh, we see them all over the place. It's one of the major targets of the prophetic critique in the Old Testament are the false prophets. Uh, usually the false prophets are telling the people what they want to hear. They're giving them all the good, sugar-coated information that they would like to hear. It's very palatable. That's how you can tell a false prophet, you know. The true prophets came along and gave a bitter pill. People didn't like that. That doesn't sound very good. That's not very inspiring. You're giving me indigestion there, Jeremiah. I don't want to hear this, you see. And so that was part of the, it's almost the way you could tell the true prophets in the Old Testament is they were always way over on the politically incorrect end of the spectrum telling the people what was the truth, but what they very much didn't want to hear. And uh, this character now is uh, Bar-Jesus, literally son of Jesus. The word Jesus is also the word Joshua. So this means son of Joshua, uh, and uh, that's his name. And he's uh, presumably some kind of advisor to Sergius Paulus, who is the governor. 
Uh, and we don't know how he got himself into that role, but that seems to be the capacity in which we find him. So Paul and Barnabas encounter this individual. Uh, and then we hear of Sergius Paulus. He was, a, he was a proconsul, an intelligent man, summoned Barnabas and Saul, and wanted to hear the word of God. Now, Sergius Paulus is said to be an intelligent man, which may make us wonder, then, how come he had a false prophet like uh, uh, this uh, Elymas uh, advising him? Wasn't he smart enough to see through this hocus-pocus superstition that this guy was peddling? Answer, no. Uh, you know, even intelligent people can be superstitious. Even intelligent people can rely on some very, uh, you know, strange and ill-advised, uh, you know, forms of counsel. And uh, so it's no necessarily a strong defense against that kind of thing. Uh, and I don't know who else he had, he had advising him, but he'd also, uh, Sergius Paulus would call on, you know, uh, this uh, Elymas to read the tea leaves and cast the horoscope and give him, you know, his advice as to how certain things should uh, take place. But Sergius Paulus, to his credit, when he hears about Saul and uh, Barnabas being in town, uh, is intrigued. He wants to know what the message is. He summons these two to come and give him a, a presentation of this message that uh, he's hearing about. And so he brings them in, and uh, then we get a little bit more of an introduction to Elymas, verse 9. But the magician Elymas, for that's the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. By the way, the proconsul is a word for governor. There were two kinds of governors in the Roman world. There were proconsuls and procurators. A proconsul served at the pleasure of the Senate of Rome. A procurator served at the pleasure of the Caesar in Rome. Many people criticized Luke for years because he called Sergius Paulus a proconsul, and at least until you know, some years back, it was thought that, that uh, actually uh, Cyprus was under the Caesar. And then it was discovered that there had been a little land swap and the Senate had picked up Cyprus and traded away some other land to the Caesar and that actually Luke once again got it right. That in fact, uh, the Sergius Paulus was a proconsul, not a procurator. Uh, that's a, that obviously is a very minor point, but it just once again reminds us of how accurate the New Testament tends to be on these historical little notes and it should give us great confidence. In any event, uh, um, uh, Sergius Paulus calls in uh, Paul, but the Egyptian uh, Elymas, for that's the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. I don't know quite how he did this. I have a, a hunch that the procon or the uh, that uh, Elymas here was not trying to dissuade Sergius Paulus from the faith by reasoned conversation raising legitimate issues that deserved a thoughtful response. There is always a place for that in the life of the church. You know, there's always a place for questions that people have in their minds concerning what the Christian faith is, how it's taught, uh, what it means, how it's applied. You know, if, if you're here and you have questions that seem to be a barrier to coming to faith, then by all means, those are legitimate questions to ask. You know, and, and the, the people who represent the Christian faith should be able to deal with those questions, uh, should be able to respond to them thoughtfully, intelligently, and help you know, work through to some kind of understanding on that. Uh, there's always a place for that. That is never out of order. Uh, proper questions. Uh, on the other hand, I think what this fellow Elymas was doing was not so much a proper questioning, but more the kind of scoffing, mocking, jeering, uh, sort of guffaws, you know, you can hear it in the background. Paul is trying to present the gospel. You keep hearing this kind of noise off in the corner. You know, yeah, 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 you can just hear the rolling his eyes. Oh, give me a break, you know. Sort of this sarcastic attitude that really isn't meeting the content of the gospel whatsoever, but is just trying to create an atmosphere of distraction. You know, the guy had an attitude. That's what we're dealing with here. And uh, he was sort of behaving probably in a sort of adolescent way to just prevent the thoughtful presentation of the gospel from really being given a fair hearing. And uh, so I assume that that's the kind of thing that was going on. 
Obviously, that is not the kind of uh, response that speaks of strength, but rather of weakness. You know, if you can't meet an argument legitimately, then you start scoffing and sneering at it. That's uh, kind of the, the way that uh, Elymas is behaving here. So Paul, uh, we're at verse 9 now, but Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. And here we have the name change. Um, I've heard people say that God changed Saul's name to Paul, and they think of it kind of like God changed the name of Jacob to Israel. And Jesus said to Simon, I call you Peter. Sometimes God does that in dramatic ways. He changes a person's name. And I think uh, at least some, uh, occasionally folks have thought that about Saul becoming Paul. Probably not the case. Uh, this is probably something that Paul himself did for tactical reasons. His Hebrew name was Shaul. It was a much less um, common name in the Greek-speaking world. Presumably Paul, in order to not create any unnecessary impediments uh, in terms of his own person, uh, just simply you know, shifts to a, a name that was much more common in the Greek world, Paulos, common name. And so I think probably for reasons of not beyond just pure expediency, uh, Paul took that name. That may have been a name he went by in the Greek world anyhow, but uh, that seems to be the only significance here. But from this point on, Paul is known as Paul pretty much uh, throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Uh, and so I can shift and start calling him Paul and quit uh, correcting myself constantly as I tend to do up until now. So Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at this fellow Elymas. I can imagine that things got very quiet. The word that's used here suggests staring at him or gazing at him, not saying a word, putting him under his scrutiny. So I imagine that Elymas himself probably grew quiet because now all of a sudden he'd become the center of the focus. And uh, everybody wondered what uh, words of grace were going to fall from the lips of Paul at this point, and here they come. He said, uh, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you, stop, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? So anything that... Um, Anything that Paul lost in diplomacy here, he made up for in clarity uh, in terms of what he was uh, trying to communicate. You son of the devil. You son of the devil. Paul had uh, seen deeply, I suppose, maybe even supernaturally, had seen into this guy's soul and knew that he was dealing with the darkness of wicked resistance to God's grace. Here was a Jewish man. Here was a man who should have been leading the charge to advance the cause of Christ, who was doing all he could to resist it. And Paul doesn't hesitate to use the most forceful kind of epithet uh, to call him on that right at that moment. It does, uh, it does give an, an occasion, I guess, to comment on this whole use in the Bible of the notion of being the son of something or the father, having someone as your father. We obviously tend to take that as referring to origins, biological origins, you know, or family connection, family uh, issues. My father, you see, is uh, William M. Gore. He's an individual. He's a, I, when I think of my origins, I go back to him and to my wonderful mother. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's what we think of. But in the Bible, those terms are actually, that is being the father or the son, are actually used more substantively in a different sense, not so much to describe origins, but to describe character. So if you are similar to something in character, then you might be said to be the son of that thing or the son of that person. On one occasion, John was, John the Apostle, was uh, with Jesus, and they were being given some grief by some Samaritans. And John said, hey, Jesus, why don't you call down fire on these people and turn them into a bunch of grease spots the way Elijah did in the Old Testament? You know, the beloved disciple John. And uh, Jesus turns to him and says, John, you are a, you are a, you are Boorganese. You're a son of thunder. <laughs> 
Not meaning that John's origins were in a thunderstorm. Not meaning that a thunder cloud had popped him out one day, and that's where he came. That was obviously not the sense of it. But rather that John was in character, bombastic, violent, so that he could be called the son of thunder, you see. On one occasion, Jesus has a conflict with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are raising questions about Jesus' paternity. Seems to be an issue he dealt with. They said, we're not illegitimate. Exactly what they said to him. We have Abraham as our father. We don't know who your father is. Even the rumors about the virgin birth already coming back in a kind of slanderous way here. You know. But we have Abraham as our father. Jesus says, you know, you are of your father who? The devil. Why? Not because the devil had given birth to them. He doesn't mean something like that. He simply means that they were liars. Their character reflected the character of Satan, who was a liar from the beginning. And because of that, they felt they were more uh, reflective of the character of Satan than the character of Abraham, who rejoiced to see the coming of Christ. And that's a, that's a kind of a common idea. In the New Testament, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You know, that there's something of being obedient to God that qualifies one to call God his father and uh, to be properly called the sons or daughters of God. The reason I mention that is because uh, you may be aware that that point has become extraordinarily fuzzy in recent decades in the thought of the church. Uh, back in the 19th century, there was the advent of a movement that had its roots in Hegel, George Hegel, and it touched many academic disciplines, one of which was Christianity, and it was the birth, really, of what we call theological liberalism. And there were many names in the 19th century that sort of uh, got excited about it, uh, you know, Schleiermacher and uh, Ritchell and Harnack and others, and, and uh, there was a, a whole movement to try to redefine Christianity along Hegelian philosophical lines, and the effect of it was what we call liberalism. It tended to humanize God, deify man, naturalize religious thought generally, and one of the things it tended to do was to remove any idea that there's any difference between those who belong to God and those who don't. And Harnack himself said, the fundamental tenet of the Christian faith is the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. That was one of his chief tenets, you know, that everybody can call God his or her father that everybody can regard everybody else as brothers and sisters in this one worldwide family, and that there's really no differences among us. You know, that was kind of the, the idea. I just want to report to you that's not the biblical outlook. You see, in the biblical uh, you know, worldview, it's a little bit of a different thing. Some people are of God, and some people are children of the devil. Uh, Ellie must be one of them at this point, you know. And as, as hard as that is, is for us to take, because it kind of jars us, Nevertheless, I think if we're going to be, you know, have any biblical integrity, we have to take that point seriously. You know, that's, that was kind of the tenor of what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. You were of your father the devil, because you look more like him than like Abraham, let alone God the Father. And, uh, you know, to recognize that, I think it'd be healthy. Now, that may sound like a war cry, it isn't. It's just to realize that as Christian people, there is a missionary and a mission field. You know, and we need to be about the business of recognizing that and carrying the gospel uh, to the world and realizing that uh, not everybody can rightly call God their father. That something of a Christian conversion and obedience to God's call on our lives is uh, built into the uh, legitimacy of making uh, such a claim. And so anyway, at this point, Paul uh, sort of lowers the boom here. Uh, you are a son of the devil. And then Paul begins to delineate why. Because everything that Elymas was doing sounded more like the devil than like anything else. You're full of, uh, you, he says, you're an enemy of righteousness. Well, the devil is an enemy of righteousness. And so insofar as Elymas behaved that way, you see, that made him look like a son of the devil. You're full of all deceit and villainy. You're constantly obscuring things. You're constantly trying to avoid the truth of the matter by blowing smoke into it. Deceit. 
villainy. That sounds more like Satan. Won't you stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? The Hebrew word zedek, righteous, means straight. There's a kind of simplicity about a straight line. But any time you, know, you start hearing about, oh, this is very complicated, very, very difficult, very hard, many, many, you know. and so we take things that should be simple, and simple righteousness, and all of a sudden becomes extremely compli- complex, hard issues, you know. Blowing smoke in to things that ought to be perfectly clear in their ethical content, for example. Uh, Paul says, you know, you're making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. I think that's what Elymas did. You know, whenever something was a simple, clear, straight-up decision for righteousness, he was there able to obscure it and confuse it and make it kind of cloudy. And so Paul says, you like life in the clouds? You're going to have a little bit of it. And he looks at him and says, now listen, the Lord is against you and you will be blind for a while. You're going to live in the kind of obscurity that you've been dishing out to others. You're going to have your head in the fog here for a while, but maybe it'll help you begin to see life in a more clear, distinct way. We don't know what happened to Elymas. It seems that this judgment had a little bit of grace in it. You know, uh, typically, um, you know, in, the new, in, in Acts, for example, judgments could be a lot more harsh. Ananias and Sapphira didn't simply grope in the fog for a while. They were dead. Uh, Herod was dead. Elymas could have been dead. You know, but he isn't. Paul says, you're going to grope in the darkness for a while. Almost implying that Elymas himself might become one who would eventually see the light. Church tradition teaches that he did become a Christian convert. The New Testament is silent on the point. Personally, I rather think church tradition is correct on this. I think the very fact that Paul says, you are going to be in the darkness for a while, that this judgment is not going to be permanent, and that there is at least tacitly, kind of impliedly, the idea that Elymas would once again see the light, and maybe see the light in ways he'd never seen it before. Uh, I hope that's true. I don't know if it is, in fact, the case, but uh, it seems implied here. Immediately, a mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. This guy who had been such a master of deceit is now living in the world of his own creation, and he needs somebody to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. It was not the miracle that converted Sergius Paulus. It was the astonishment at the teaching of the Lord that converted him. The miracle certainly confirmed him in his faith. Miracles do that. If you have faith, a miracle will deepen your faith. If you have no faith, a miracle will simply harden you in your disbelief. That's why, you know, Romans chapter 9 talks about God hardened Pharaoh's heart. How did he do that? By giving him so many reasons to believe, and yet his heart remained unchanged. And his hard heart simply became harder and harder in the face of every compelling miracle that God dished out to him. Uh, Sergius Paulus came to faith. Uh, He came to faith because of the preaching of the word. The word is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The miracle certainly confirmed him in that faith. Let's, uh, Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're grateful for your grace among us this morning. We thank you for the testimony of the apostle, for the great conversion that took place on this occasion, uh, and for the uh, further drama that unfolds as we follow his career. We pray that you would continue to bless us and watch over us, and especially the service that follows. We pray your spirit would be present to uh, anoint all that takes place, that it would honor Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.